Good evening. It's nice to be here in this crowded church. <laughs> I'm sure it tells us that the angels are watching, doesn't it, the scriptures? Uh, I just wonder if there's a few gathered around us tonight. Just read a few verses to you from James 5, verses 13 through to um, 20. It's about prayer. Is any one of you among, in trouble who should pray? If anyone is happy, let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins each to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. I'd like to uh, look at the subject of effective prayer tonight and what that is, what it means to us and how we can be effective. But first, a bit of Biblical history, really. It was before the flood, God made a promise and a covenant with Noah. And you can read that in Genesis 6. Because God's heart out with the promise was that Noah, he'd given instruction to build the ark and he was, given, he was given the promise that he would be in the ark. And God did this because his heart was grieved that he had made man. Because the state of man's wickedness and his evil thoughts uh, and the evil thoughts of his heart. And you know the story, the flood came. Mankind was wiped out except those in the ark. God saw Noah's sacrifice after they came through that and came out and Noah made a sacrifice. Uh, took some of the, some of the uh, animals that had come in uh, with him into the ark and he made a sacrifice and God saw the act of sacrifice and it says that he was pleased. And he blessed Noah. And he blessed Noah and his sons. Genesis 9. And he gave them authority over all the animals and the uh, living creatures that moved on the earth. And he gave them for food. He gave them the authority to have the animals for food. So even when... Um, the government in their wisdom say that lamb and beef is abandoned or prohibited after 2029. I think I'd still like a, a joint of beef. <laughs> but then God made a covenant with Noah and his sons that he would never flood the earth again. A rainbow is the sign of that covenant and we're all familiar with that. We see it today. And that covenant remains when God makes a covenant, it will remain for his purposes. And this one was, it would remain as long as there's an earth. So throughout our lifetimes, we can expect to see the, the sign of the rainbow. And God's covenants are, are one-sided. It doesn't depend upon our input. God promises and he carries out his promises. It's another whole lesson in that for us, but... Just the fact that God promises and it, that promise remains. But Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. And from them came the, all the people that were scattered over all the earth. That was their commission, to go into all the earth and multiply. But Noah got drunk. And Ham came in and saw him naked. And I don't know whether he gloated over that, but he saw his, his father naked and he went and told his brothers. 
and the other two, they came in, they walked him backwards and covered Noah with a, a garment. But then Noah cursed Ham and he made a blessing over Shem and Japheth. And you can note here that out of Ham came the father of the ten Canaanite clans. Those people were scattered. They dwelt in tents and were, nom were nomadic. They had freedom, they were directed to go into all the earth. And the Canaanites, they were scattered in what became the promised land from Sidon as far as Gaza and towards Sodom. And just remember what went on in Sodom, what sort of people they were. And the Canaanites were rebellious people. But the first city ever built on the earth was, uh, was built by Cain. And he named the city after his son Enoch. And it was, but uh, despite the fact that they'd been told to uh, multiply and go and fill the earth, Cain decided instead that he would build a city and so contain that spread. It was built by man in rebellion to God's word right at the very beginning. And it was the same after the flood. Man was rebellious, or there were a, a good proportion of men were, were rebellious. And you know the story of Babel in Genesis 10, Genesis 11. They wanted to build a walled city whose tower reached the skies. It was probably built by a man named Nimrod, who was reputed to be a mighty hunter. And we see there the motives of men. They were, just look at them for a moment, they were uh, defiant of God. They wanted to be a tower that might reach to the heavens so that they could be like the most high, a rival to him, if you like. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted reputation, a monument to our greatness, they said. Something to be talked about by future generations, a memorial to their pride and their ambition. And as it was, they built a city to prevent their dispersion. They wanted a, a walled city to bring them together, to keep them from scattering, to create power. But this was contrary to God's will. It was a rebellion of God's will. God had said in Genesis 9, go and multiply and fill the earth. But here they were doing something contrary to that. And so we have Babel. What we can see from there that they were the people of Babel. They were all in agreement together to do it. They said, come, let us build. They, had, they were unanimous in effort and in purpose. Many together with a common purpose. And they could build greatness. And that's what they aspired to do. And if, when you think about that, that same principle abounds today. All across our world. In so many different areas. What man, just think what man has accomplished when in agreement in space, technological industries, medicine, commerce, you know them. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing and generating, but it's just seeing what man can do when they come together and they're of one purpose. And it says that the, the people of Babel, they stirred each other up. They began to talk about construction together. They said, let us make, let us build. You know, and coming together and stirring each other up is, is quite a spiritual uh, principle. We should be stirring each other up. Here in our small churches, in our bigger churches across the land, we should be stirring others, each other up to good works, to good, to follow the will of God, to find the will of God, to search the word. In many churches, I don't think that happens. But that's what we should be doing, stirring each other up. Here, many were in agreement. They were resolute in their purpose. They overcame obstacles. There was no stone to talk about in, uh, or mortar. But they made, they made bricks and they, 
They burnt bricks and from mud and they used slime to keep it together and so they built. And that, uh, the spirit of that is reflected in, in the, who the Babylonians became. They became a great nation. They were, it was self-effort and they were cunning as, as Babylonians. And you read about that in, in Daniel, how they came and uh, defeated Israel. They had strength of purpose. Became a great nation, as I say. They stumbled on a secret that has prevailed ever since. The Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them, because they became one and they pulled their energies and they stirred each other. They were in agreement in, in unity of purpose. They shared a common language, so they built a tower. Men are building their towers today. In, in our society, they're building towers. Starbuck's building his tower. Just think what, the, what that is, what that means. The good or the bad, depending on the purpose of the, of the group that's come together. I don't want to comment on our, our government, but uh, it's... How can I say? It's not a, it, I don't see it as a good, righteous government with the things that they're planning, the things that they're doing, things that they're allowing, the rules that they're passing in, in, um, in, in Parliament. That's another story. But the reason I'm saying this, just think what could happen if Christians were united if all the churches in Chesham came together as one, just think what they got, could, you could accomplish in Chesham with united spiritual prayer, prayer effective prayer. The trouble is we've, we've been, we've been sp split up. Uh, Satan's principles are di divide and rule, aren't they? And that's what's happened to the Christian church. But if we joined together, we would, I'm sure, if we came together in united prayer, things would happen. Just let's, for a moment, compare the, the Christian motives. We want to be compliant with God's will. To see and do his will and, and to go and to carry the gospel into this, this world. Two, we want to glorify God, not to glorify ourselves. We want to see his name magnified and upheld among the nations. We want to reach out with the gospel and to see men and women saved. See the, the lost come to Christ. So we should be stirring each other up in these ways. I don't see that happening in the churches that I have any you know, contact with or have a, um, a, a view on. Just don't see it happening. All I see is division from our leaders of our churches too. There doesn't seem to be any unity of spirit. We should be stirring each other up, walking in unity of purpose in accordance with the clear word of God. Seems to me that the that, that the church per se is, uh, is turning away from the word, the truth of the word of God. Psalm 20, 122 says, let us go to the house of the Lord. This is how we should be stirring each other up. Let us go to the house. We should be stirring our neighbours in the same way. Isaiah said, let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's adhering to the truth of the scriptures, the Bible as we have it and not letting our own opinions and the, the opinions of the, uh, the cultures that we live in dictate how we should conduct ourselves. Jesus said, If two of you agree down here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. 
For where two or three gather together because they are mine, I am there among them. Just think what two or three believers together in agreement can achieve. We are so separated in our society today. You could be in a community of people and be on your, be, you can be lonely. But just imagine, had strong purpose about it, if two or three of us got together and prayed, what difference we could, we, we have the clear promise of God here, that he would, if we ask, he would do it. So we should stir, stir each other up to do that, to be together in prayer, to make a difference in this society, in our churches, in our families, even in our nation. We've been called, um, you and I, we've been, uh, since our uh, conversion, we've been separate, set apart by God to be a kingdom of priests. We're not just individuals walking about, meeting together on a Sunday. We're called to be a kingdom of priests. I wonder what that conjures up in your mind, what you feel, what we should be, how the, what the actions of a priest would be. A priest are intercessors, I believe. They carry the word of God. They carry the word of the good news of the, of the gospel. And we're called to be a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. We're called to pray effectively and with fervour. Let's start praying in agreement, twos and threes, in families, in fellowships, in churches. What a difference it could make. And I'm speaking to myself here to, as well as I am to, to yourselves. If we were in earnest in these things, about these things, we'd make time. We'd make time to come together and to pray. Because the people that do that see a definite difference. They see things change. They see nations change. Things happen when you pray. Andrew Bonar, you'll know the name, I'm sure. Are we serious about prayer? He says, we must continue in prayer if we are to get an outpouring of the Spirit. Christ says there are some things that we will not get unless we pray, unless we fast. Yes, prayer and fasting. We must control the flesh and abstain from whatever hinders direct fellowship with God. That's Bonar. Tozer said, we need a baptism of clear seeing. We desperately need seers who can see through them in the midst. Christian leaders with prophetic vision. Unless they come soon, it'll be too late for this generation. And he was right. Our generation, the generation that we grew up in, we needed these people to secure the following gen generation. This generation uh, that's coming needs you and me. There's no reason why God should not raise us up as seers. But the thing is, we need to come together. There, may, there needs to be that coming together of people in prayer. Not just to meet, but to come together before God and to pray. An example here, I've, I remember reading of that Korean church. I'm sure you all were aware of it, Yonggi Cho's church. In the, in the 60s, it was about 10,000 members. But they covenanted to meet together to pray for growth and for the salvation of souls. And 10 years later, they had over 100,000 people. But they used to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to pray, not just the pastor and his couple of deacons, but the church, the church came together. They had five services a day for it. That's prayer, isn't it? And look at the results. I understand, I was on reading really last week, there's a church in India, not hard about, can't remember where now, it's over 300,000 people. And they're now praying to open another four mega, 40 
mega churches. They're coming together to pray and things are happening. We don't hear about this in the press. You only hear it occasionally when there's a report in one of the Christian papers or something. But God is at work. God is alive. Things are happening because people pray. I've got a little note here, I'm sure you, many of you will know of, of David Hathaway. He's 92, by the way. He's 92. He's been in ministry for 74 years, converted when he was 12. His father was a Pentecostal master, uh, preacher. But he gave his heart to God and he's been serving Christ since. He was the man that went to, that was um, put in jail in Siberia for taking Bibles into Siberia some 40 odd years ago. But I just, I get his, his newsletter. I'll just read just a part of it. It says, we're not neglecting the urgent situation in Ukraine. Our day of prayer in Kyiv in June was a miracle. Despite the constant Russian missile attacks, 8,000 people came into the sports palace in central Kyiv. Every Christian denomination united and in crying out to God for deliverance. The Prime Minister of Ukraine wrote a letter which was read publicly by his representative. The letter concluded, the united prayer of the Christian churches of Ukraine is a testimony of the spiritual unity of our nation. I am convinced that this all nation prayer will become a symbol of our unwavering faith in victory and a bright, blessed future. And then he goes on to say, by the time you receive this, I got this two days ago. I shall have been back in Almaty, in Kazakhstan, for the 20th. The 20th National Day of Prayer for the whole of Central Asia. There's more power in prayer than we can fully realise. He says, my life is a powerful witness to this. Two things have dominated the 84 years of my life since I gave my life to him. The power of prayer to change the impossible and the gift of faith to act and do those things that are impossible. Truly, God's word says that with God, nothing is impossible. In Kiev, since the war broke out, he's conducted eight or nine, I'm not sure it's eight or nine, days of prayer. And each time he's had congregations of something like 8,000 from all the denominations. And he's had, had the support of the mayors of the towns and even the, the, um, the prime minister. Sorry, at my age, words go. <laughs> the prime minister supports. So there are just some examples, really. And I remember too. Uh, in, the, in the last war, when King George was it called a day of prayer and the nation prayed. And what happened? The, the boats went across the channel like it was a mill pond. And then there was at the same time, there was another man praying Hyde, I think his name was, a Welshman, who prayed for uh, things that were happening in the, in the, in, uh, throughout the world, uh, throughout the, the war. God answers prayer when we pray. You know that, and I know that. But God says that when two or four, or two or more come together in prayer, believing, then he will answer. He will hear our prayer, and things will happen. I'm sure we've all, we've all got testimonies of, of things that have happened in answers to our prayers. But when I read that when men come together, they build effigies, they build towers, they build conglomerates and corporations. What more could the Christians do? If only we would come together with the same determination that those men who build corporations. If we came together to pray as they, as they come together and, and, and deliberate and build, then our churches would be full today. We'd be, a, we'd be a, a force for Satan to contend with. But we've given up, haven't we, as a nation? We've turned our back on Christ. There's no truth out there anymore. What is truth? It used to be called the gospel truth. Today, anything is truth. It's your opinion is truth. 
It's not what the Bible tells me. The Bible is my truth. The Bible is our truth. We need to put our trust in it. And if God says that if two to come together and they pray, he will hear and he will answer, that must be the truth. And he will hear us pray. So what is effective prayer? The Hebrew word for prayer is tefillah. And it encompasses petition, uh, worship, thanksgiving, praise, confession and communication, communing. At the root of tefillah, apparently, is the word palal, and it means to think, to judge, to differentiate, to clarify, and to decide. Prayer, therefore, is an introspective process that helps us examine ourselves, judge situations, differentiate between right and wrong, clarify our relationship with God and decide on a course of action. That happens when we come before God in prayer, when we're led by the Spirit of God, not shopping list prayers. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but it doesn't carry the intensity of the prayers that we should be praying. James 5.16 says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's the New, Ten, New James, King James Version. Another version says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and wonderful results. And we cannot doubt that. That's prayer. It's effective. And we need to find that for ourselves. Unfortunately, effective there in this translation is, is not perhaps the happiest of translations. It merely states that prayer is effective and it avails much, it achieves much. We know that prayer is effective. Effective, the Greek word is ergonomony. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation. So the, the word effective would be better translated energetic which is derived from that word, anagumani. The word, that word effective, it refers to that which has power. Our prayers should have power. The word, that which in its own nature is fitted to produce an effect. It doesn't actually produce an effect, but it will achieve it. Fervent, the other word. What does that mean? Well, I looked that up in the dictionary and it said it was glowing or ardent or intense or hot. Have your prayers ever been called hot prayers? You know, if you lose yourself before God, your prayers become very fervent. They have energy and power. That's the kind of prayer that's referred to there. It's not listless, it's not indifferent, it's not cold or lifeless, as if there was no vitality or power in it. And we should believe that our prayer has power. And I believe that we would deliver our prayers in a different emotion, a different way. The kind of prayer that was referred to here is efficient. It's earnest, sincere, hearty, and that means full of energy, and it's persevering. We keep on. One word to better translate fervent prayer would be energetic or earnest prayer. It expresses the force that James was trying to get across. Commentaries suggest that this kind of prayer is inwrought by the Spirit. In other words, praying in the Spirit. Being led or empowered by the Spirit. Sadly, I find that prayer meetings, a lot that I've attended over the years, they've not been this kind of prayer. We've... we've We've lost our understanding of prayer. 
and they were what I call shopping list prayers. I'm sure you've heard that term. And we come to the rule with our petitions and there's no energy in it. I think if we were, if your life depended upon prayer, I wonder if you, if I'm not, I, when I say you, I don't mean you personally, I mean, <laughs> you know, the church per se. Um, would you pray in the same way that you do when you go to an ordinary prayer meeting and you pray the shopping, shopping list prayers? I don't think so. I think if your life depended upon it, you'd be, your, your prayers would be intense. There'd be a cry out to God. You'd be screaming before God for salvation, for healing, whatever it may be. We'd put a lot more energy into our prayers. We would mean what we prayed. Half the time, I think that when we pray our shopping lists, we don't actually believe that God's going to answer those. Or he may, he may do in the course of time. But God says that anything that we believe, uh, that we come together, two of us believe in, and ask him that he would perform it. I've got to believe that true, otherwise the Bible doesn't mean anything to me, does it? I've got to believe the promises of God. I'm, I'm, I have to say, Laura and I pray together and we've seen some, some things happen in our lives. Other stories, other stories, I'm sure you have the same. But I know the truth of this. And I would, I, but we should be stirring each other up so that these things happen. So that when a prayer meeting is called, it's attended. So that people come with expectation. They believe what they're praying for. And they look for the answers to see God's hand at work. I believe that when we pray earnestly, whatever the Whatever we're doing, whether it's petition or whether it's praise and thanks and uh, these other um, types of prayer that, um, that we should be done uh, with our full emotion. We should pray, pray believing, mm -hmm. acting on faith, believing God's word and we'll see, we'll see things happen. But then the other thing in that, uh, that verse says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. That's really the qualification, isn't it? A righteous man. If we're not righteous, then there's a barrier. Righteous, we must prepare our for ourselves before God. In Exodus 19, God says, you will be to me a kingdom of priests, my holy nation. If you're a chosen people, you're a kingdom of priests. Reflected in Peter's letter, first, first book of Peter in 2.9. says the same thing, you're a kingdom of priests, God's holy nation, his very own possession. And that's who we should be. We've been called to serve God, to be clean and fit for service. That's our responsibility. It's not the pastors, not the deacons or the elders. It's our responsibility, you and I, before God. We must examine ourselves. Being a priest doesn't mean we don't have problems. But character defects might disqualify us from authority and service. And I found this eye-opening, really. God said, or the Lord said to Moses, Leviticus 21, verse 16. God said to Moses, tell Aaron that in all future generations, is that us? His descendants who have physical defects will not qualify to offer food to their God. No one who has a defect may come near to me, whether he's blind or lame, stunted or deformed, or has a broken foot or hand, 
has a humped back, is or is a dwarf, or has a defective eye, or has oozing stores or scabs on his skin, or has damaged testicles, even though he's a descendant of Aaron, his physical defects disqualify him from pre presenting offerings to the Lord by fire. Since he has a blemish, he may not offer food to his God. Disfigurement or deformity or disobedience in the priests rendered him unsatisfactory for service. He could not present offerings to God. He could still eat from the Lord's table, however. He wasn't put out of fellowship, but he couldn't serve. I think there's a lot of people like that in our churches. These physical ailments, they can be applied spiritually. When I thought about it, I, I could see blind people who are unable to see God's purposes. Lame, once good, now useless in the Lord's work. Stunted, no growth in them. Deformed or twisted, a wrong view of God. Broken foot or hand, serving men, not God. Dwarf, smaller vision, smaller vision of God's will. Defective eye or a squint, looking in the wrong direction, cross purposes with God. Running sores, festering hurts, holding grudges, damaged testicles, no reproduction, no view of the lost. If any of those things apply to our lives, we're not fit to serve before the Lord. We would, we would, we would never appoint a man uh, with a flaw in his character to be a pastor or an elder in our churches. And that's so with God. He was protecting the integrity of the priesthood when he made that de declaration. And when he says that we should be righteous, that's what we should be. We can't expect our prayers to be effective. It doesn't matter how fervor, with fervour we, we pray. If we are not righteous, we can come to God. But there's a barrier and we need to, we need to cl be cleansed and washed and covered in the, in the precious blood of Christ and redeemed or transformed through the renewing of our mind. Washed in the blood, cleansed of our sins. The onus is on us to get right before God and to deal with anything that our lives would hinder that relationship with the Holy God. God is holy. We've been set apart at conversion, but we must work at it. We've got to put off the old man. Work at it so that our lives conform to God's view and to God's will. So many people today express their own opinion about the word. They read it and say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. I don't believe in that bit. I believe that we've got to put on the mantle of God. We've got to be cloaked in the garment of salvation. We've got to be covered in the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus. Then, as a royal priesthood, we can enter the very throne room of God, the throne room of heaven. And there... We can present our praise and our petitions. And as a kingdom of priests, we need the covering of salvation, the anointing of his spirit. That's the spirit of Pentecost, I believe, to guiding and leading us in these days. 
We all need a Pentecostal filling of the Holy Spirit. That was the promise of Jesus. When we, were, when we became born again, we were, we were baptised then into the Holy Spirit because we were baptised by the Holy Spirit into the realm of God. We were cleansed, made whole. But Jesus' baptism is, 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 is different. Jesus promised that if we waited, and we waited on him and they waited up until the, uh, the disciples waited at Pentecost, and they were filled, they were anointed with the Holy Spirit and equipped for service. And I believe that's the same today. Jesus said, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. If we are righteous and we are led by the Spirit and filled with His Spirit, then we can do the things that Jesus authorised us to do. He gave us His authority to act in His name. That's what the scriptures tell me. And if the scripture says it and it's Jesus' own words, then I believe it must be true. You and I can walk in power that we've never dreamed of. I was at a testimony meeting only yesterday morning. A young girl, she was, I'm not sure if she was from Iran, but she was certainly from out that way in the, in the, in the Middle East. And... Uh, her, she came from a, a Muslim family and her father was a, uh, a senior man in the local mosque and very well thought of and she was brought up in a, in a very strict environment. Uh, I won't go through the whole story, but she came to the UK when she was 20. She was, uh, couldn't speak the language. Uh, she had no money. Uh, she went to Manchester um, to the Muslim peoples and um, she, she'd become quite a worldly girl, smoking, drinking, dancing, all the other things. Uh, and they, they put her out. And so she went to the, the food halls, Christian food halls, where uh, they look after people. And they embraced her. They showed her love. They fed her. They clothed her. And so she gradually got on, on her feet. And then she... She said, I'm a, I'm a Muslim. I can't do what, you know, you'll go to your church. But they didn't argue, they just loved her. And they provided for, clothed her, as I say. And eventually she becomes a Christian. I was 20 year old then, she went, in a few years, she went back to see her father. And uh, he wouldn't accept what she'd become. But she talked to him and he would have nothing of it. But one night his father was asleep and he woke in the middle of the night and he saw in the corner of his room like a, a window appeared. And he said, through that there came a, a shining light, a bright, brilliant white light. And out of through that came a man and stood before him and said, I am the man of the book your daughter's been telling you about. I'm the man of the book, man of the Bible. And he told his daughter, he didn't know, what, didn't know who this man was. So he asked it, or she explained to him that this was God. Three days later, the same thing happened. And this, he said, this is where it gets difficult because of my hearing. I can't, couldn't hear exactly what she was saying. But I think... The, 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 the second time, this, what he saw, the person that he saw, I am the man of the Bible. That was a, this, she must be now in her 40s, or oh, well, the late, mid, mid to late 30s, two children married now. She's a teacher up in Manchester. But she, uh, the same thing happened to another. He, she met a woman in a hospital. This woman um, had been going to this it was a, a, woman's, a woman's hospital for treating people who, who could, couldn't have children. And this woman had been coming to the, this was in Iran. She'd been coming for 12 years. 
and couldn't have a baby. She'd been told that day that she, that she would not, not have children. So this uh, young girl, she then was in her late twenties. She just prayed for this. She said, would you like to have a baby? She said, yes. So she prayed for her and they went their different ways. And three months later, this woman managed to contact this young girl through because her husband was in the hospital and through him she found out where, it, where she was. She said, I'm pregnant. Six months later, she had another text. She said, I've got twins. She had twins and she'd been told for 12 years that she was not going to have any children. If we pray in the Lord's name, these things happen. She prayed for another man who'd got cancers. He'd got cancer, had been, had been told that it, it, there's nothing that they could do for him. And he was going back for his last sort of um, review or whatever it is with, with his doctors. And they took another um, X-ray. And they said, that's, that's the one you've had today. And that's the one you had two weeks ago. And there was no cancers. They couldn't find any cancers. This is just a young girl who had an experience with God, filled with the Spirit, praying for people. These things we, can happen for you and I if we dare to believe. And if we come together as those people at Babel, if we come together as a community to pray, then things will happen. They will change. We can see churches growing. This country, as we heard today, I sent a little um, a YouTube clip, clip around. Martin had it and some others. Um, Chris, can't remember the name. Anyway, he's a pastor. And his message was the church needs house, house churches. Because all our, our major churches in the UK, they're all squabbling over LGBT and you know, same-sex marriage and all these other things. We've lost the anointing. We've lost the authorities. Mm -hmm. If we come together in Jesus' name, the two of us together agreeing, or two more of us than two, then we can see God working and God acting and God healing and God delivering. We can see salvation come to our friends and our neighbours. But we need to pray about it. We need to come together believing. And so really in, in conclusion, if we wish to be effective for God in our prayer life, in our church life, and our walk with God as members of the royal priesthood that we are, and be effective in our prayers for our nation and our town and our family, Firstly, we must, set a, set a, must be clean and be set apart. We must be set apart in holiness, cleansed. We must come together and strive for that unity in the spirit instead of being divisive and seeing things and people arguing about you know, um, where the chairs, what sort of chairs you have in church or, you know, those minor matters. That goes on in churches, doesn't it? There's argument about those things. We need to come together in prayer and the unity of spirit. There should be no division of purpose. Our purpose is to see, uh, to be in agreement with, with, with each other and to pray for those things which are in God's heart. I believe that prayers should be in earnest and they should be energetic, praying as if our life, very lives depended upon it. Pray for the will of God. Not our own will, not our own shopping list, but praying for the will of God. And as we learn to pray in the Spirit, our spirits will be stirred. The Spirit himself will stir us. And we'll do expo exploits for our God. Our lives won't be the same. Jesus reminded, reminded his disciples that Father knows what you need before you ask him. God knows. He emphasised that prayer is not just about saying words. It's about relationship with a living God. Do we have, do you have a relationship with the living God? And you can know that you can have that relationship by inviting Jesus into your own lives. That your sin is cleansed and you're made anew. Made a new person when Jesus comes in. In short, 
we must be right with God. We must be focused, I believe, on his will and not just on our own. And if we can live in harmony in this way, cloaked with the spirit of Pentecost, through prayer, we can do anything that Jesus did. After all, he gave us that authority. You remember the when he, he got the 70 disciples together and he sent them off into the villages and they came back because they were amazed that the demons were subject to them and they healed the sick. That's what we should be doing. It happens for those that believe. And there are lots of, lots of testimonies to that fact. God is alive. The thing is, we have to come together believing and just ask. Thank you. I trust that Lord will speak to our hearts to stir us, each of us individually, to stir us, stir us where we are, to what we do and how we behave. What is our prayer life? Let us get right with God. Let's see what he will do through us. Thank you for listening. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>